David's going to come and read for us now. Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are you also the called of Jesus Christ, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Brother Paul, through the inspiration of the Spirit, declares who Christ is and his relationship to him as his servant. All believers are separated from their former religion to be followers of Christ by redemption, through Christ's blood and resurrection from the dead. Open our eyes to see as Ken preaches your gospel. Amen. And so begins our journey now through this epistle of Paul to the Romans. I know you're not supposed to have favorites. But this just happens to be one of my favorite epistles. And I preached on it some years ago. But now here we are again as the Lord has directed to bring us back to this epistle of Paul to the Romans. It's an amazing thing when you think just about the title. Because who were the Romans? They were one of the most ruthless empires that this world has known and ruled for many, many years, out of which we have today even remnants of the idolatry of the day, and particularly in what we know even as Rome today. But here God had an elect people that God purposed should have a letter written to that people. It wasn't written to all the Romans, but to that people in Rome that the Lord had chosen and for whom the Lord Jesus Christ had paid their sin debt and the Spirit had called to Christ to look to him, even in the midst of all of that idolatry. I say this is great encouragement for us because as we look around, even at our own nation, look around in the world, idolatry is rampant and yet I look out here and I see some sheep I see some that the Lord has drawn out of all of that idolatry and brought us to sit to hear this glorious gospel of Christ and that's really the gospel unto which the Apostle Paul was separated and that's the title of this message separated unto the gospel of God from the world standpoint, how likely would it be that God would take a Pharisee of Pharisees and reveal Christ in him because he was likely of that Sanhedrin that determined his death and yet he didn't know that when Christ was dying, he was dying for him. And then when he sent him out to preach, he didn't send him to the Jews, he sent him to the Gentiles. And therefore, we have here one of those many epistles of Paul that are written throughout the New Testament, not to Jews. A lot of people say, well, I think Paul wrote Hebrews. Well, he wasn't a, an apostle to the Jew. Paul typically, as he begins here in verse 1, every epistle began with his name. Not that it was because he wanted it to be prominent. But as the scrolls were written back in the day, it's like we do. If you get a letter and you open it, you just see an address. You go and look and see at the bottom of who wrote it. Well, back in the day when scrolls were written, the very first part, you wouldn't want to undo the whole scroll to see who wrote it. Right at the beginning is that name, Paul. And he was an apostle. He himself declared out of due season. And yet... Here he was declaring the gospel of God. So the very first thing I want us to consider here by way of introduction is just how Paul 
introduces himself. And this is important. He does not in any way in, try to influence the readers by the importance of his person. No. What's the first thing he says? A servant of Jesus Christ. And that word servant is literally the word bond servant. A bond servant was one that had served the master, was indebted to the master, and in the Old Testament would literally go and have his ear bored to mark his total consecration to that master until he died. And so this is how Paul introduces himself, really in three ways. First, his name. And do you know what the name Paul means, by the way? Little. That's a pretty good name right there. A nobody. I know we like to elevate people above measure, but there's only one to be elevated, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody else is small, takes their place at his feet. And so here is Paul. Names mean, means little. Second thing, bondservant of Jesus Christ. How different that is from the way preachers today like to take titles, doctor, so-and-so, and worst of all, reverend. There's only one reverend, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ, one worthy to be revered. And then called to be an apostle. The word apostle there means a sent one. So if a, an apostle is a sent one, there's one that does the sending, and that's his master. As a bond servant, he awaits his master's bidding and goes forth as the master so declares. So here we have here the introduction to this epistle of Paul to the Romans, known also as Saul of Tarsus. It's not that he changed names. Saul was his Hebrew name. Paul was the Greek name. And it's, again, a way that he purposed to identify with the very people to whom the Lord sent him as Gentiles. Paul. When I'm over in other countries, the way they pronounce my name, Ken or Kenneth, you might not recognize because it's just a different way of saying it in those languages, in those countries. And that's the same here. It's not that he changed names, but this is a Greek name that he took. And in the book of Acts, particularly chapters 8 through 28, you can see how the Lord met Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus when he was breathing out hatred toward any that identified with Christ and his cross. And it was on the way that the Lord arrested him, stopped him, brought him low. He wasn't converted by any so-called free will of his own. He wasn't even thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, when our Lord stopped him and uh, he asked that question, who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom you persecute. To persecute his body is to persecute him. And all throughout the epistles, Paul keeps coming back to that testimony of how it is that he was even called to be an apostle and separated unto the gospel. But his testimony is not unique to him. I believe every one of us, if the Lord has taught us, this is how he's taught us. He's brought us low. He showed us the sinfulness of our sin. He's opened our eyes to see Christ, the crucified one, and how through his death, God has once for all reconciled and justified those sinners for whom he died. So it's a grace for us even to enter in. Now, it's almost universally agreed by different commentators that Paul was actually writing to the Romans from the city of Corinth when he was on his last gospel mission. They call it the missionary journeys of Paul, first, second, third. I like to call them the gospel mission. That word missionary you don't even find in scripture. It comes from a Catholic description of missionaries, people that were 
priests that were sent out to establish mission stations. Paul didn't do that. Yes, he was on a mission, but he was a gospel preacher and went out several times. But in Acts chapter 20, you don't have to go far, just turn back a few pages. In Acts chapter 20 and verse, verses 2 and 3, while Paul was in Corinth and wintered there, it's likely that this is where he would have heard about, because to this point he himself had not visited Rome. In Acts chapter 28, we find how it was eventually he was taken to Rome as God's prisoner, prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. But even before then, here in Acts 20, while he was wintering in Corinth, it says there in verses 2 and 3, when he had gone over those parts and had given them much exhortation, he came into Greece and there abode three months. And when the Jews laid wait for him for, as he was about to sail into Syria, he purposed to return through Macedonia. And there accompanied him Asia into Asia, Sop Sopater and Berea and the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus and Gaius of Derby, and Timotheus and of Asia, Tychicus and Trophimus. They're going before tarried for us at Troas. So it's thought that while he was in this particular place that he would have taken the time now to write this epistle back to the Romans. And this would have been somewhere between 53 AD and 58 AD, well before the fall of Jerusalem. But we find Paul here, the Lord giving him an interest in these people that he had never met to this point and yet had heard of their testimony and therefore the Lord directed him to write this epistle with the entire focus being on who God is. You want a good theology book. A lot of people are always recommending what theology book do you like? Well I happen to like Paul's because the word theology literally means the study of God. And you can't have any greater study of God than to hear it or read it from one of his apostles that he raised up and taught of himself, taught of his son, and separated him out, as he says there in verse 1, separated unto the gospel of God. Underscore that. Not a gospel, not a one of many, but the. I like the definite articles. There is only one gospel of God that declares him for who he is. And this is the whole purpose then of writing this epistle that those to whom he writes might know who is this God and that's why the spirit directed him to write it and to see how a just God can be just and still declare righteous sinners such as we are there's only one way it's through the death of his son and we know that you can read through history how many different people have written commentaries on the book of Romans and have drawn comfort from it, particularly those that are the Lord's. And I can put myself in that number. How comfortable, how comforting is this epistle to those of us that desire to know something of God. The word God can do this yourself look it up in a concordance actually is found 153 times in Romans in this epistle that's an average of once every 46 words so it doesn't take much in reading it to figure out what the subject is who is he who is this God this is more frequently than in any other New Testament books and in comparison there are other words that we find that are used many times and that's where we can see the purpose of Paul in writing this because when you write to the Romans what are the Romans known for their judicial system they were 
the ones that even today much of our law is based upon what was established back in that Roman Empire. And so, guess what? The word law appears 72 times. But so also the name Christ appears 65 times. Sin, 48 times. And the term Lord, 43 times. So this gives you an idea as you read through the epistle to the Romans of what Paul, by the Spirit, is addressing. That is God and his sovereignty, a sovereign judge and ruler over all, his law, and how it is that that law can be satisfied. And what is our place as sinners before him? Also the word faith appears 40 times. So these are some key terms that we're going to be looking at as we study through this epistle. But ultimately, just like any of the scriptures, the purpose here is to show the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ as God's satisfaction. If you have what they call a theology, but it is not in, by, and through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, then it's false. That's why that term is so important here. Separated unto the gospel of God. And it begs the question then, what is that gospel or who is that gospel? And I believe that as we go through here, we're going to see how Paul underscores what that gospel is and sets it forth and declares it in the 16 chapters that we're going to go through. I don't know how long it's going to take. I figure if I got to die on some sacred ground, let it be here in Romans. That would be kind of a nice place to end, wouldn't it? Hearing the word of Christ through the gospel. But if the Lord gives long life to me and you, we'll see you on, on the other side. But as we go through each week, let's cherish every word let's it doesn't matter what book it is let's cherish this as the very word of god so here's where paul now introduces the gospel to the romans just like any writer it's the, a writer will state his purpose in the preface and that's how paul has introduced himself in a very humble manner but gets right to the point separated unto the gospel of god we know how he was separated unto the gospel of God. In Galatians 1.15, it says, When it pleased God to reveal Christ in me, then he went forth preaching Christ, and he did not consult anyone. He didn't mix in any way what he had learned in Jewish religion and bring that in and try to combine the two. Now, what he's showing is that this gospel of God shows that Christ has fulfilled all that the law required, all that God's justice required, that God might declare righteous everyone for whom he paid the debt. And this is not some new doctrine. I know today it's so foreign in many circles where people even call themselves Christian. I know that from preaching on the radio or even over Facebook, nothing's hidden. Everything's public. And you would maybe be surprised to see how many people respond in a sense of, I've never heard this before. And these are people that have attended places of worship all their lifetime, as if it's some new doctrine or some new teaching. Well, this is not new. This is as old as the beginning of God's revelation all the way back there in the Old Testament in Genesis when the Lord told Adam and Eve that he would raise up a seed that would crush the head of the serpent. And even so here, you can see how Paul goes all the way back concerning the gospel of God. It's the gospel that was promised through the prophets. You see that in verse 2, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Any definition of the gospel that does not go back to the prophets and the scriptures is not the gospel. 
I know some people think, well, Old Testament, New, isn't there a separation? No. The New is built upon the Old. In the Old, the New is concealed. In the New, the Old is revealed. That's where we see how all of this from the beginning was to set forth the Lord Jesus Christ as God's Savior. This is not some clever invention of men. That's what Peter talked about. We're not coming up with cunningly devised fables to try to philosophize and, and wow people's intellect. No. This gospel of God to which Paul was separated was not new, even though it, it seemed new to many who heard it, just like we have today. And I know it was new to me because I'd been through all of my theological training so-called and then when it pleased God to reveal Christ in me it was like how did I miss Christ and so it came as new to me but as I went back and started reading the scriptures the reason I missed Christ was because I was reading with the lights out you ever try to read with the lights out <laughs> in fact I'm getting more and more to the point with my eyesight even with the light on I've got to kind of hang over under the lamp and Take a look at it. I need more light. But that's the way it is. It might seem new to us, but when the Lord does turn the light on, oh, how refreshing it is. It's kind of like getting up in the morning, you know, and it's a new day. How many sunrises have you seen over your lifetime? And yet everyone seems new and fresh, at least for those of us that are awake. <laughs> Some sleep in a little bit. The only time they see is a sunset. But I like the sunrise and I like the sunset. And it's new. Just like it says there in Lamentations. His mercies are new every morning. That's the only way this is new. When the Lord brings it to our minds and hearts. New and afresh. That's a good thing. But it's not, not some new doctrine. When Paul was preaching there on Mars Hill. There were a bunch of philosophers around and. They came, they were curious because it sounded like some new doctrine. And they loved, just like you have today in chat rooms on Facebook and some of the social media, people love to just sit and chew on these things intellectually and yet have no personal interest in knowing how God can be just and justify. Nor do they see their need even of Christ and his shed blood. They just talk about it in intellectual terms. And that's what people do until the Spirit of God is pleased to reveal Christ in him. But Paul is not bringing anything new here other than reminders. And that's why he says here, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. This is how the Lord taught his disciples and his apostles to preach the Scriptures. And that from the beginning, starting with Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, all of these things, he taught them how these pertained to him. And this is how Paul would have learned. But if you were to ask me, can sum up the gospel in a phrase or a sentence? Well, Paul does it right there in verse 3, doesn't he? Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's the sum of the gospel. It concerns God's son. So you got the father and the son and the spirit. The three are one. But God, the father, his purpose that the son be the one that's glorified. And so it is with the spirit. He doesn't speak of himself. Christ said that when he comes, he'll not speak of himself. But he'll take the things that pertain to me and reveal them unto you. So here we see the sum of the gospel. It's all about the Lord Jesus Christ, God's son. You remember when our Lord asked the, the disciples, who do men say that I am? There in Matthew, and one said, well... Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And then what the Lord say? Who do you say I am? And that's where Peter spoke up. And he said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Thou art the Christ. That's the anointed one. 
the son of the living God. And that's where the Lord said to him, flesh and blood haven't revealed this unto you, but my father, which is in heaven. That's a blessing to have him reveal. It's the only way to know him. We're not going to know him through our own study, our own research. We'll probably end up coming up with more questions than answers like philosophers like to do. They're good about answering, asking a lot of questions, but not giving a lot of good answers. Here, it's simple, it's straightforward, it's to the point, and uh, it's the way that we're to declare the gospel or Christ to our generation in simplicity. Let's don't get too smart for our own good to where we think we can come up with different ways of explaining the gospel to people and methods. No, it has to do with the person. And this is the very heart, just like the sun is the center of the universe and everything turns around the sun, so it is that Christ is the very center of all that pertains to God. And uh, it's the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not a system, not a plan. People talk about a plan of salvation. No, it's not a plan. It's the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here it goes on to explain in verse 3 who then he is. You know, every one of those terms is important. He's the Son, he's Jesus. Name Jesus means Savior. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. He's called Christ. That's his title. The Anointed One. In the Old Testament, the only ones that were ever anointed were prophets, priests, and kings. Who's Christ? Prophet, priest, and king. He's God's prophet. He's the only one through whom God speaks for the salvation of sinners. He's the priest. That's why he came, to be that priest, that mediator between God and his people that he came to save. Not only the priest, but the sacrifice. And then he's the king. He ever lives to intercede and to rule and reign today. It's not that he wants to be king. He is king. He's ruling over his earth. But we see here which was. So... The second part of the scripture explains the first, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power. Made and declared. He was made of the seed of David. That's what was promised that to David, that the Lord would raise up a seed to sit upon his throne. I know some people today are still waiting. They think, well, that hadn't been fulfilled yet because he has to come back and literally sit on a throne in Jerusalem. No. The apostles, when they preached, preached that at his resurrection, when he rose on and sat down, he was seated upon that throne. He's that promised seed. And so for that to be true, to be born of the seed of David according to the flesh, that's talking about his humanity. And this is the mystery of godliness, that God was made flesh. There's some things about that that we simply bow and believe, not that we understand it. It's a mystery. It's the mystery of, of godliness. And yet he was 100% God. He wasn't half God, half man. He was 100% God and yet became 100% man but without sin. He did not take on the sinful nature of man. He was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. But that's why from his conception there by the spirit in the womb of Mary, born of a virgin, born of a woman, that God purposed that this one coming in the flesh should be preserved from any sinfulness in him. Never at any time was he ever sinful, nor could he be. Not even when he went to the cross and bore the sin of his people, took it on him, that sin in no way tainted him. He took it as the sin bearer. But at the same time, it says here, declared to be the Son of God with power. This tells me that there's no further prophecy 
that we're to look to that is yet to be fulfilled with regard to the scriptures. All of the Old Testament pointed to this one time and this one person who should come in this world made of the seed of David according to the flesh. So he was truly man and yet what? Declared to be the son of God. Those are important words. He didn't become the son of God. He was declared to be the son of God. In the Greek that word declared is an interesting word especially in light of what we're looking at here in verses 3 and 4. It's the word horizo, H-O-R-I-Z-O. Now, if I was to start spelling that, and I got to H-O-R-I-Z-O, and I said, you finish the last two letters of a word that you can think of in English, what would you say? Horizon. Horizon. Now, what is a horizon? Well, that's where the sun rises. And certainly in Christ, when he's declared to be the Son of God with power, it's the rising of the sun, not S-U-N, but S-O-N. And if you've ever been someplace on an ocean where you look out there with the curvature of the earth and you see the horizon, you can't really tell where the skies and the earth meet. You just know that somewhere it appears that they're meeting together. And you can see why even in this word declared, in this context, it's the perfect word to describe how Christ can be at the same time God and man. It's like the horizon. The visible part of the earth, that's what we see in him as the man when people looked on him walking on this earth. That's who they saw, a man. And yet, just like the horizon, where does the sky meet there? This was none other than the God-man. So declared, that's, he's manifest, declared to be who he is, both as the seed of David came from that royal seed to accomplish the will of his father but declared to be the son of God and then of course the term there concerning Jesus Christ our Lord he's the Lord of all of this earth and yet those that he is taught by his spirit how precious he is to be able to say, our Lord. Just like the psalmist said, the Lord is what? My shepherd. I can't tell you how many times over the years as I've attempted to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ and all of his sovereignty and glory and honor had people in the end grincing, grimacing and gnashing their teeth and saying, well, he might be your Lord, but that's not my Lord. Well, there's only one Lord. And uh, he's the one bef before whom all will stand or fall. You can run, but you can't hide. I'm just thankful that it has pleased God, just like the Apostle Paul. He wasn't looking. When he was stopped there on that road to Damascus, he was doing anything but looking <laughs> to bow. But the Lord brought him to bow. And I would say that's the same with me. I was pretty self-satisfied with my understanding of the scripture that I had at the time, how I'd been brought up, how my relationship with God was based upon a profession that I'd made when I was a child. And all I was trying to do was maintain that relationship as best I could. That was my thinking as far as what salvation was. And oh, what a surprise when it pleased God to isolate me, even while I was out in Africa preaching. I wasn't preaching the gospel at that time. I was preaching men's theology. I was preaching what I'd learned like a parrot, poly parrot, and yet did not know Christ until it pleased God to open my eyes and to reveal himself in me. And that's 
where I can identify with what Paul says here about himself. Separated unto the gospel of God. Separated unto this one who is the gospel. That the, all of the scriptures declared. What a surprise even for Paul. He knew the Old Testament scriptures. He just didn't know that they pertain to Jesus of Nazareth. And that's the same with me. I knew that the scriptures spoke of one who was to come and did come, but I didn't know him. See, none can know him unless he's pleased to reveal himself in them. And that's where Paul then gives the glory. Notice here in verse 4, when he talks about declared to be the Son of God with power, everything that Christ did in the flesh declared who he was with power and with authority, whether it's his miracles, whether it was his word, even when the Pharisees sent to arrest Christ and the Hussians that he, they'd sent came back empty-handed and they said, well, where's Christ? Why haven't you arrested him? What'd they say? Never a man has spoken like this man. Even when they came to arrest our Lord in the garden, and he asked, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. That was a derogatory term. And he said, I am. I know they add he, but all the Lord said was I am. That's, that's the term for Jehovah God. And they fell backward. There were like 600 that had come to arrest him. And not one of them could remain standing. They fell backward. Such was his power. He's declared to be the son of God with power. Even from the cross, he was declared to be the Son of God with power. Did not that centurion, this was a man hardened. You didn't become a centurion. You weren't a low-level soldier. These were hardened soldiers, accustomed to seeing blood shed. That's why they were put on that duty of crucifying. And yet, what did he say? Never, truly this is the Son of God. Never as a man died as he has died. Why? Because no man took his life. He said, no man takes my life. I lay it down of myself and I take it up again. Such as the commandment that I've received of my father. That's power there. As much as he was beaten. And that crown of thorns put on his head. It would have weakened any man. And yet, none of that diminished his strength or power in any way. And when everything had been fulfilled, that's the way Matthew writes it in his gospel, that it might be fulfilled. When everything had been fulfilled, there wasn't one thing left undone that the Lord Jesus Christ cried with a loud voice, not a whimper, but what did he cry? It is finished. That's how he's declared to be the Son of God with power. We sing that song, there's power in the blood, power in the blood. Well, that, that blood is just as powerful to save as what God has purposed. And it saves everyone that God has purposed. It wasn't shed in vain. There's none in hell for whom Christ died. If they're in hell, then God purposed that they die without a mediator and without a ransom. But there's none in hell for whom Christ died. That's good news. But even here when it says declared to be the son of God with power. Notice according to the spirit of holiness. Another way of saying that is according to the Holy Spirit. He's the Holy Spirit. But what does the spirit do? Reveals this Christ and all of his power. But the greatest demonstration after his death of that power was what? Resurrection from the dead. The grave could not hold him. I'm thankful that's the case. When he died, that sin was put away. There was nothing to hold him in that grave other than that what the scriptures declared. He should be there three days and three nights. And then he rose again. And with power. When the women came to that tomb, they were coming with the thought of embalming his body. They had not even heard what Christ had said, that he would rise after three days. And yet for that, he didn't reject them, cast them off. But when they got there, that tomb was already empty. That stone was already rolled away. 
And it wasn't any man that did it. It was the Lord himself with power. He was raised from the grave. Why was he raised? Well, Paul tells us that a little later here in Romans, that over there in Romans chapter 4 and verse 25, who was delivered for our offenses. That's why he died and was raised again for our justification. That word for means because of. He wasn't delivered in order to our offenses. He was delivered because of our offenses. And it's the same word, was raised again because of our justification. People say today, well, you're not supposed to make justification the timing of justification and it, a gospel issue. It is. Because with, when he died, that's where justification was accomplished for those that the Father had given him. It was in his death that he was satisfied. And you try to say that's not a gospel issue. You've just stripped the gospel of its very heart. Read the scriptures. That's what he's declaring. And that's the power. When he was raised, it was to demonstrate that the work that he came to accomplish was fulfilled. And now he's ascended on high. And as the high priest, he's taken into glory the name of everyone from the beginning of time to the end of time that the Father has given him. I don't know about you, but that's good news. That's what the word gospel means, by the way. When it says separated unto the gospel of God, it's separated unto the good news of God. There's no good news in telling sinners, well, here's what God has done, or here's what Christ has done. Now the rest is up to you. Or as you hear preachers say, you take the first step and God will do the rest. There's none of us that could even take a step. And I'm thankful that God doesn't even require a step. It's not my steps. It's the steps that my Lord took as he walked on this earth and went to that cross to pay the sin debt. And now, by that very resurrection, the spirit of holiness, the, the Holy Spirit declares him to be the Son of God. And that's why Paul concludes here, and we'll stop here in verse 5 and come back, pick up with this next time, where he says, by whom? By whom? That's what salvation is. By whom we have received grace and apostleship. Here he's talking about how it is he even became an apostle. It wasn't through his theological studies and learning at the feet of Gamaliel. No, by whom we have received grace and apostleship. And it says there, for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. What is the faith? Well, that's the revelation of Christ as set forth here in his word in connection with who he is and the death that he accomplished. That's the faith. That's the faith once delivered unto the saints. He's not talking about our personal believing here. But as Christ is set forth, he says we have received grace. That's the only way you could ever know him. And apostleship, in other words, being established as one whom Christ would send forth as an apostle, even though out of due season. For obedience to the faith. What's that talking about? That word obedience means the hearing. If you tell your kids, did you hear me? You give them something to do and they don't do it. Did you hear me? If they don't do it, they didn't hear you. That's why they're not obeying. But when they hear you, then they're going to obey. Well, that's that word. For the hearing of obedience to the faith. In other words, where God grants that grace. Sinners bow to him who is the object of that faith. And uh, that among all nations, this wasn't just for the Jews. That's why Paul's writing to the Romans. And that's why he says in verse 6, Among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. So we're going to stop there for now. And Lord willing, come back to this. Because Paul's desire was that he might be able to one day see them in Rome, even though to this point he had not yet. But called to be 
saints. That's in verse 7. We'll take up with that next time.